this puts an interesting spin on the new youth. A, that is a youth movement, perhaps mm -hmm. particularly provocative at this time in China, which placed traditionally so much emphasis on the older generation, mm -hmm. honoring your parents, mm -hmm. honoring your older siblings. So youth really shakes that up mm -hmm. in a very profound way. And you see this then demonstrated in the story of Ah Q, which is all about the way the eldest sons of the richest families make it in the village, and anybody else like our anti-hero Ah Q is on the margins. Right, and it's interesting how they make it, because the way they make it is the way people have made it for around a thousand years in China, and that is through the imperial examination system. So how system. does that work? It started in the first decades of the Common Era, and it's an examination system that starts on the kind of local level. If you pass the exam on the local level, you can move on to the regional level, to the level of the province, and finally to the federal level, as we would call it, the imperial in the imperial academy. And it is the way to get into government service. So if you want to get any kind of government jobs, and these are often the most lucrative, the cushiest kind of jobs to get, you have to pass through this examination and what does system. the exam involve? What's interesting and fascinating to me about it is that the exam essentially involves literature. So not just literature in the narrow sense, there's also old texts that have to do with conduct and ritual, with divination, with historical records, what is called the Confucian classics. So these are ancient texts that Confucius presumably edited. He didn't author them, but he presumably edited them, at the center of which is in some way a poetry collection, the classic of poetry. So for almost a thousand years, anyone who wanted to enter government service had to pass this incredibly grueling and rigorous exam in literature, writ large. So you had to be able to write eight line poetry, exactly. acceptably complicated, regulated verse, you had to know all those rules and right. be able to do it. Now, why would that be a way to train for government service? Well, I think on the one hand, of course, a high level of literacy, interpretation, writing skills are important even today, one might say. But I think it was also the fact that such an exam was instituted at all was an attempt to create some form of meritocracy. Mm -hmm. It was an attempt to instill cultural values that were different from that of a warrior class, where just the power of the strongest mm -hmm. somehow dominated. So it was an attempt to institute a genuine bureaucracy based on a meritocratic system. So 2,000 years ago, they're inventing what in the United States will be the SAT, That's the right. GRE, the LSAT, right. the MCATs, right. all of these exams rolled into one yeah. and based on literature and history primarily. Right. Exactly. You could say that for those 1,000 years that this exam system was in place, China was ruled by a kind of highly mm -hmm. literate mm -hmm. elite. I think the most literary focused kind of society imaginable, mm -hmm. perhaps. And I think we also have to understand, as you're saying, literature in a broad sense, the idea of when encompasses all kinds of serious writing, but also order, the order of the universe is reflected in this. Call there's a, a saying from the classical period that if the emperor wants to cross a river, he finds a man who knows bridges. But if he wants to rule a province, he finds a man who knows men. And poetry and history were really the privileged access to understanding human behavior and nature. And I think poetry was also crucial for operating at court. Communicating through poetry was important. In the course, we've encountered something like this in the tale of Genji, mm -hmm. where writing waka poetry was the most important form of communication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think something similar exists mm -hmm. in China. So it was actually an important skill for that cultural context. And this carries on in these new youth intellectuals, Lu Xun, Hu Xie, their friend Lin Yutang, they never think of literature as some separate realm as of pure kind of aesthetic right. play. They're right. writing also polemical tracts, philosophical works. They're interested in history. It's a very broad right. conception of the literary. And at the same time, though, this exam system is sort of the background for the story of RQ, which is abiding critique, because even though the original idea may have been meritocratic, it of course sort of degenerated into one more bastion for the privileged. So in the village in which the story of RQ takes place, it's the 
sons of the two richest families that can afford to send them to give them the kind of training. The SAT prep. The SAT Years prep. Years worth e of. Exactly. And it's the hold. eldest son of the right. most important families, right? right? Not the N second son, not the not eldest the daughter. daughter. It's exactly. going to be always that. And of course, you know, in Chinese families, traditionally, you would actually be known not necessarily by your proper name, but you are first son, second son, right. third daughter. Right. That's how you're right. called. So the hierarchy is totally right. inscribed just in how you call each other in the family. Exactly. So it isn't quite as meritocratic as it was perhaps mm -hmm. meant to be. Though it's still a grueling exercise in Nanjing, I think is the largest exam setup that still exists in Nanjing, the southern capital. And you have these rows of open air booths in very small booths in which the students would have to spend many days. They wouldn't be allowed to leave. They would sort of curl up under these very cold conditions, subsist on very little food and subject themselves to this extremely grueling experience and then hoping to make it to the of next level. Of course, that level. itself is clearly viewed as a test of character, yes. right? It is a rite de passage. If you can do that, then you have a kind right. of moral fiber as not just you can write well, right. you know, which you could show in an hour anytime, but that you've actually been through this. Right. You have the staying power. You have the strength of character right. that you need. It's a rite of passage. You know, not unlike the kind of severe boot camp in a military situation right. you know, right. or medical school residencies. You know, right. Can you survive? incredible hours, right. a lack of sleep, all right. those things, a kind of ideology of that. Right. So it's so interesting then that in these revolutionary times that Lucian is talking about, the story begins with the examination system being abolished. Right. And what happens to these eldest sons when the ground is pulled out from underneath them? Well, from this perspective of RQ, who is the lowest of the low, in a sense, we see first the ridiculous and undeserved privilege that some of those few in the village who have passed the exam system in the past enjoy. They, it's seen as a kind of undeserved privilege they get, but at the same time... And they even start to get called Mr. Provincial Examination. M <laughs> Mr. Provincial Examination, and it's very clear that no matter what some of the characters in the story think about it, that Lu Xun thinks this is ridiculous pretense that the whole examination system needs to be abolished. So I think it's very clear that Lu Xun and the other members of the new youth movement were very much in favor, in a sense, of abolishing this old system that oriented this society perhaps too much towards the classics, mm -hmm. too much towards the past, and which they are now hoping to open to new influences. But how does this work out in the story? What about the son who gets with the new program and goes abroad for Western education in Japan, right, as so Lucian had done? The whole story, in a way, provides a very interesting perspective on revolution. This is the time of revolution when the Communist Party first starts to establish itself, when the traditional order is no longer just a given. And there is hope, perhaps, that a genuine revolution will abolish this ruling elite that has a grip on society in parts through the exam system, but that's not quite what happens. These sort of privileged eldest sons of the rich family sort of join the revolution as fast exactly. as they can. They, exactly. they try to co-opt it. Particularly funny is the one who goes abroad to study. He returns and is known locally as Mr. Fake Foreign Devil. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he's not even a genuine foreign devil. Right. He's a fake foreign devil. And there's no indication ever that his foreign education has any use whatsoever right. in the village. At the same time, Lu Xun had to deal with the prejudice. So as a nationalist movement develops in China, Lu Xun was sometimes accused of being a fake foreign devil himself since he had gone to Japan. Exactly who is more and more seen as really the enemy and is tainted by that. So it's kind of seen as a ridiculous thing in the story, but it's also a real thing. Having gone to study in Japan becomes a kind of dangerous thing mm -hmm. and a suspect. As his brother was even more suspect, in fact, for having perhaps collaborated with the Japanese government exactly. later on. Even before that, he's still exploring these tensions and being very right. skeptical towards a possibility of just instantly changing. Right. And he's a wonderful kind of literary sensibility portrayed here. So particularly telling details like the cue and how it's used, mm -hmm. the sort of long pigtail that the men are supposed to wear, which had been imposed by the foreign Manchus when they took over China some centuries earlier, made to wear these. Now people are cutting them off. So you could recognize them on the street. That's right. right. So it's a humiliating kind of marker 
that foreign ruling elite imposes onto the That's right. Chinese. That's right. Uh, so then it's a certain sense of pride to cut it off, but then people start to compromise and they don't quite want to cut it off. So they sort of <laughs> tie it up on the head a little bit earlier. They would do that in the summer. Anyway, now they tie it up earlier and the perfect image of this kind right. of revolution that isn't quite right. a change if it's really just you tie up your queue a right. little bit sooner. Those who pass the exam are now the loudest revolutionaries. That's right. But um, then the revolution turns against them. They think they're co-opting right. it, but then they're getting bled by these essentially bandits who are using the revolution. Right. Possibly even the magistrates are in on the take right. and refusing. Right. So the rich people in the village are getting robbed. And rather than deal with this, the magistrates look for someone to blame and they fix on AQ, the kind of drifter, the minor criminal. They accuse him completely falsely and force him to sign a false confession.